first of all, my name is Nelson Blythe, obviously born and raised in Uniontown, Kansas. Uh, what made me decide to be sheriff? So I've wanted to, I've always wanted law enforcement and military since I was, since I was as young as I can remember. Um, but as far as being the actual sheriff, I grew up, you know, watching politicians and this is not to speak bad about anyone else. This is just my motivations. But I grew up watching politicians and people in power constantly back down from what I believe is right and what I believe the majority of people that live around here believe is right. <clears throat> so I want to I want to be the guy in that position to not back down, you know, to hold to what I believe is right. You know, you know they they they'll back down on second amendment issues. That, you know, you've seen lots of churches and law enforcement agencies, you know, back down to covid restrictions and things like that. So, I don't want to be that guy. And as far as law enforcement, you know, that's just that's, so that's more specifically why I want to actually be sheriff and run the sheriff's office because I think that position is immensely important and I think is a time coming when it's going to be the most important position as far as protecting our everyday rights. Um, but other than that, law enforcement, I just love, I love the job. I love, I love going door to door, talking to people. I love the, the opportunity it gives you to interact with so many different people. You know, like if you're driving down the road and you see someone with a flat tire or something like that, you know, I have a natural desire to, oh, I want to go see what's going on with them, help them out. Well, if you're not a cop, it, people get kind of weirded out, you know, it's like, who's this guy? Can I trust him? You know, but wearing the uniform, wearing the badge, put you in a position. What's his you angle? Can, exactly. Wearing the uniform and wearing the badge put you in a position where you automatically have a certain amount of trust so you can, you can offer your help and you can be that person that people can count on. So, um, then plus like any other, you know, red blooded American, of course I like the car chases and everything else that comes with law enforcement. So. <laughs> Those, those moments of excitement that yeah. break up the hours and hours of boredom. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, I have, uh, I'd actually wrote something out here to read before we started the sure. so I'm gonna go ahead and read that real quick. Hopefully I can, anyway. Uh, hey, fellow rednecks, I am here with Detective Nelson Blythe. Uh, he's a candidate for the Bourbon County Sheriff's Office. Um, I asked the Facebook group concerned Bourbon County citizens of property rights, what they would like to know from our candidates for sheriff, arguably one of the most powerful offices in the county, responsible for a lot more than traffic stops and arrests. Uh, and the questions, first one I'm gonna go with uh, is from Jody Taylor. And she asked about the, uh, she had to put a post up on Facebook asking about money for the dispatch. I think that was a city thing. I don't know how okay. much that would be with your office. What was her specific question? Uh, what were I, what were your thoughts on? Do they need to? Do they really need to spend more money? Or gotcha. Well, so the dispatch is run by the city of Fort Scott, um, so it's not a county deal. Although county pays a certain amount of money to make use of their services, um, and I don't know. If, I currently don't know what their budget is because um, that's the city, or what their plans to increase it are. So I don't know if, it, if she knows something I don't as far as they're planning to a personnel increase. But um, so I, yeah, that's, I don't know anything about their budget. Okay. <clears throat> but the, the services they do provide, um, from my perspective, are, you know, it's, they're essential, obviously. You have to have dispatchers. And from what I know about them, they're, they don't seem to be overstaffed. You know, a lot of people work, um, you know, there's only two per shift. Sometimes there's one per shift. So I, I, I think they're pretty much running on bare minimum. So. Yeah, that happens a lot around small towns. And another one from here, from her, from uh, Jody Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, how would or did, as an officer, you handle the COVID lockdowns and mask mandates? So I don't want to, I think it would be unfair of me to talk bad about another political, you know, another sheriff or something um, because I wasn't obviously in control of anything at that time. And I don't think anybody, I think that took everybody by, you know, it blindsided everybody. Yes, sir. So it's going to be easy to second guess, oh, I would have done it different. So I'm not going to sit here and do that. 
that being said, uh, looking back, I hope we've learned enough from situations like that, that going into future situations, we can say, hey, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Right. So we don't, we don't make those same mistakes. You know, churches don't stop meeting. You know, not everyone says, you know, is wearing a mask while they're driving down the street, you know, yeah. you know, all, all that stuff. And, you know, we're not going to be shutting down public gatherings. We're not going to be using law enforcement to enforce these, these unconstitutional, arbitrary, you know, Dr. Fauci, whatever laws. Or oh, I think we found edicts. out, didn't we find out just like a few months back that pretty much all that was, was guesswork on his part? I mean, I, yeah, I think the whole thing was guesswork and I, I, I'm, yeah, I won't get into the, you know, the vaccines. I never, I never end up getting vaccinated, but I'm, I've talked to people, you know, just firsthand experience how they believe it's negatively affected them. So, yeah. I don't know. My mom's an RN and she had to get it through her job and thank God she hasn't had any complications, but, uh, yeah, she said that she's known other people that have had complications mm-hmm. from it, or at least they believe it's from it. Doctors should say it is, but... Yeah, the, the COVID situation, it should have been a wake-up call for a lot of people. And now that, we, now that we've been through that, it's important to have leadership that going into situations is going to have their head on, had their head screwed on straight saying, hey, we're not going to, we're not going to do unconstitutional, unconstitutional things because of scare tactics, fear factor, whatever they're trying to do, right now. That's good to know. Uh, And then we had a question from Ronnie Glover. He says, how would your office be different than previous sheriff's department, sheriff's administrations? Mm -hmm. Not to speak bad on the back of the other guy, but you know. Reasonable question. So, and I think she, okay, so how would I be different than past so there's a lot of there's a lot of things for one i think i'm going to be and again it's hard to say i'm just going to say what i would like to do and people can infer sometimes incorrectly that because i'm saying that the other party is not doing what right. they should be doing but what i would like to do and what i think would be different than stuff that's happened in the past is have a very open honest friendly, cordial, cooperative relationship with all other elected officials. Um, even if we disagree, you know, I was on the county commission with, with some, with other two commissioners that I very often disagreed with. We always maintain friendly, you know, cordial business relationships. You know, there was no blow ups on my part. There was no, no shutting down of communication. So that's going to be, yeah, keep, keep things civil. And, you know, it's one thing, you know, and it's not, it's not just saying, Hey, you know, I'm going to be open, transparent, honest, anybody can come talk to me, whatever you want. You know, it's, it's more active than that. Like not wait for people to come to you to clear up things, but you, if you, if there is a miscommunication, then you go to them, you make an, an outward effort to make sure that we have peace and unity. So. And clear communication. Yeah. All right. Uh, another one from Ronnie Glover. Uh, how about implementing community service actions for inmates? I'm not real sure what he meant by that. I'm assuming like having inmates that are trustworthy enough to go out and pick mm-hmm. up trash or mow grass or, or whatever. I think, and I think Ronnie Glover is, if it's who I'm thinking of, I think she's a lady, actually. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> sorry. And she, well, and, hey, it's 2024, you know? Yeah. But so she asked, what was her question again? She, uh, about community service actions for inmates. Yeah. So I understand that. I think the tag of her, the last, the last part of the question was, uh, to, so they can be giving back to the community. Yeah. Sure. And I understand that it's called corrections, you know, they go to jail, so it's supposed to correct behavior. And there's, there's a lot of things, um, you know, they're, you could say they're not going to benefit by going to jail. Um, but that's not law enforcement. In my view, that's not law enforcement's primary goal. It's definitely good, but their primary goal is to enforce the laws and keep people that could reoffend and hurt society off the street until they're um, you know, tried and either found innocent or found guilty. 
Um, so that's the primary goal of law enforcement. We, we're not counselors or anything like that. That being said, there's so many opportunities that any cop knows while you're dealing with these people to try to counsel them, to encourage them to go to church, to build relationships with them and outside of jail, put them in touch with people that can support them. You know, there's a lot of people, if they're users, for instance, of methamphetamine or whatever it is, they don't know anybody else outside of their immediate circles. All the people they know are users. Um, so helping them get in contact with uh, churches, you know, like for instance, I've talked about before, Bethel Church, they go, they send uh, preachers into the jail, you know. So it's not definitely, it's not the role of the sheriff's office, but as sheriff, I would, I would do nothing to hinder any of that. And I do think it's a good thing. Um, it's not for, you know, taxpayers shouldn't be paying for that type of thing, Correct. but facilitating it to where volunteer groups or whatever can make that happen. Then absolutely. Basically, as long as it doesn't negatively affect the job performance of the office of sheriff. Yeah, you absolutely. Problem. You know, <clears throat> they do need to, you know, everybody needs to hear the gospel and, Amen. and, Bethel, and I'm sure there's other churches, but I know for a fact Bethel is very good about weekly sending people in, share the gospel, help people. Uh, there's job opportunities for them when they get out. So that stuff is very important, just not the role of the government. Gotcha. I, I like that. Uh, and he, she um, asked if there were, what were your plans for the future? Well, a very vague question, but um, <laughs> very what well. I would like to what I would like to do is I want to start. Right now, there's thirty something inmates in our jail. They house seventy four. <clears throat> They're capable of housing seventy four inmates. I want to start trying to generate revenue by housing inmates from other jurisdictions. That's what is. That's what the the jail was billed as when they first built it. They said, "Hey, yeah, gonna say we're going to generate. Were... We're going to generate revenue." Um, and there's never really. That's never really come to fruition. Um, and I'm not going to point blame as to why. But so my first priority is going to try to remedy that situation. And if if for some reason it's not feasible, then I'm going to take active steps to educate the public why we're not doing it. These. This is why. Um, but Lynn County, the yeah, Lynn County Jail, <laughs> the Lynn County Jail was built a year, two years after our jail or more, um, and they got theirs immediately, housing inmates out and started generating revenue. Yeah, so that is weird. Hmm. Other than that, you know, there's, I believe that I could save overtime hours by me and other salaried personnel working patrol shifts. I love working patrol. I know the sheriff has a lot of other duties, but I still believe I'll have plenty of time uh, to cover patrol shifts. That way, not every single time a deputy is sick or has to go on vacation, it's being covered by another hourly employee. You know, uh, I think as, no as much as possible, have salaried personnel cover cover shifts. And other than that, I just would want to be a very, a very active, very active sheriff involved with the deputies day-to-day -day work uh, involved with helping them staying in, staying in touch with the cases they were asking them if they need help staying in touch with the, you know their morale issues you know being very involved and being helpful and being present and letting them know that you have their back uh, is good for morale okay um and another question i can't remember who this one was from i just have it marked down is from our channel uh, um, are you going to be able to make the budget public? The budget, I mean, the budget is like, what do they mean by public? It's like, <clears throat> you like can. Available to, to find. Gotcha. Well, readily. It's. <laughs> or I should say, without having to go through 900 pages to get to it. Because a lot of times I, they'll, they'll hide them, you know. Yeah, I wouldn't take any active step. I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't take steps to hide anything. You know, you can access, you know, all the budget stuff you can be accessed with core requests and, and things like that. But if, if someone makes a specific quest and they go through the legal channels to get it, then absolutely I'll, you know, facilitate them getting that. Right on. 
And then the next two were actually from my wife. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, she was wondering about, uh, granted they're gone now, but there were homeless in the park. And uh, I think it's called Bridal Vale mm -hmm. Park or whatever, mm -hmm. um, out off on 2nd Street. And uh, why was that allowed? <laughs> Well, so it's city property, and it's public property, and being homeless isn't a crime. You know, there's, it, it's definitely an issue, and we don't want it to become an issue, but it's, you know, as far as just, they camped out for a couple of weeks, as far as having a, a campaign to up and move them out, um, there's, there's a lot of constitutional issues that you could run into with that. You know, now you can, if they're causing a disturbance, you can have a trespass on certain properties. Um, but those particular, um, you know, it's not like they were out causing riots or, you know, right. causing trouble. Yeah, um, homeless issue is a very, very sticky issue. You know, I, you know, you make contact with them on a daily basis when you're working patrol. A lot of it is, drug and mental health related and sometimes we're able to put them in contact with people from southeast kansas mental health that find a placement or find them another place to stay some of them are just passing through but it's you know it's <clears throat> it's not a yeah, crime I, to be homeless no so and i a lot I, of times you know, i do have compassion a lot of compassion for him because yeah. i was homeless for about 10 days down in branson yeah so i i get it <laughs> yeah it could happen it could happen oh, yeah, to anybody but, yeah and just, there's a lot of Americans right now are about paycheck away from that in all reality. True. Now there is the, you know, there's also the aspect of people doing nothing to help themselves and the old saying, poor man has poor ways. There's truth to both, both situations. But. I went down there for a job and ended up getting pretty screwed over and ended up couldn't get back. And yeah, it was, mm -hmm. that time I finally did get back, it was bad, bad, bad. <laughs> And uh, her other question was uh, pedophiles. She's noticed that there's a, a large number of sex offenders in town. And why? <laughs> well, and I know another sticky issue. Yeah. Of. So I don't. I don't. I don't necessarily think there's any more here than anywhere. Oh God. Um, you know. Yeah. I think that. You know, Fort Scott Police in particular, you know, because we most of them come to the Fort Scott Police Office just because uh, we have the most population here in the county. Right. Um, I think that we take reports of that and allegations of that very seriously, and um, we investigate them thoroughly. And sometimes we have what's called ICAC. It's a Internet Internet Crimes Against Children. They will bring us cases because they're constantly monitoring interact internet activity. They'll bring us cases and we follow up on those. So it may give the appearance that there's more than other places. In reality, I don't think there really is. Okay. <clears throat> I like that answer, with an honest answer. <laughs> um, and I know her, her, after seeing that movie, Sound of, Sound of Freedom, mm -hmm. she's been kind of on a little crusade, mini crusade about that. Honor. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day because we recently had some of that, you know, the jail roster, public record you can see. Um, it's like, man, how many people like this are there? <laughs> yeah. And but, do we have enough wood chippers? That's my <laughs> opinion. My opinion. Um, but anyway, I didn't want to take up a whole lot of your time. I answered all the questions that Facebook asked. Not that I really like Facebook, but it was the best mm -hmm. place I could go to get community people. Yeah. And I know a lot of people talk about why our tax is so high here. And I, you know, if you watch commission meetings, I've talked about this a lot too, but it's very, it's very true and it's very frustrating. The taxes aren't high because the sheriff's deputies are driving a new patrol vehicle. The taxes are high because everybody you arrest for theft or possession of meth or whatever it is, they have a Kansas State benefit card in their wallet. Okay, it's in their pocket. You can get, go look up security camera footage at Walmart or G&W or whatever, and they're buying things with taxpayer money. So, and some of these people are actively engaged in criminal lifestyles. So that's why, that's, that's a big reason your taxes are so high. It's not because 
oh man, looks like the sheriff's office got some Durangos. <laughs> it's because we're putting the bill for about 10% of the population that does nothing. Yes. So, and that's a, that's a state issue, that's a federal issue, that's a morality issue, that's a worldview issue. And you know, we've slid down the moral, we've degraded, our morals have degraded so much that this is the result. You can't have, you can't have peace and unity and prosperity outside of Christ. Exactly. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm in a way glad that my grandparents passed away when they did. Yeah. Because they weren't alive to see how crazy it has gotten. If you have a mass turning away from Christianity, this is, you yeah, can't expect, exactly what, you, what, do you, what do you expect? You can't, you can't say, oh, we love everything that the, we love everything, the beautiful mansion that was built on the foundation, but we don't need the foundation anymore. Right. No, there's a reason. There's a reason we were prosperous and, and things were good. And we have, and we still do have a great society, comparatively speaking. It's because it's built on a foundation. And Jesus Christ, you know, what is it? The guy built his built his home on the sand. You gotta build your home on the rock. Exactly. When the wind and waves come, that you know, the house will stand. You, need you, need you build it on the sand, the winds and the waves that come, and the house will fall, and great was the fall of it. So and I think that's what we're experiencing now. We have to, you know, as an and this is and again, this is not the role of the sheriff. This is just the reality. We as a nation have to repent of our sins and turn to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you know, we're gonna continue dealing with the consequences of our sin. Amen. And uh but uh and I, I agree 100 um, percent but like I said I'm not gonna take up any more of your time I've already went about 15 minutes longer than I expected to go um, but I do appreciate you, you taking the time out of your day yeah thank you for having me it's been you're a pleasure. very welcome um, and uh, just for 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 reference I've reached out to the other candidates you're the only one that did you reach out via Facebook? I reached out via email to the sheriff's office. Um, the any other candidates? I can't remember if I've reached out to or not. I really gotcha. only knew about you and Bill yeah. Yeah. until earlier today, actually. Well, I am uh, got my phone number. Most people yep. have my phone number. I've gotten a lot of phone calls about uh, about the people who said they received the letter, and uh, they've all been good. They've all been good except one. So that, that several people called me, hey man, I got your letter, I love it, thank you, give me a sign, I'm all about it. And then I got one call, it's, I looked down, it's, it's, it says California, it's a number from California. I'm like, well, <laughs> I guess I'll go ahead and answer it. And I, I answer it and he answers by saying, are you the clown that's running for sheriff? <laughs> uh, so, for the most part it's been good. My daughter keeps a little ooga horn by the, by the phone for when yeah. that happens. But, you know. Yes, I, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But no, it's, it's been a good response, and um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has, any legitimate questions that are coming from a sincere desire to have an answer. Right. So. And it, it, without, without communication, you know, we ain't going to get anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's one thing that, that I've noticed is one side is, is willing to, to kind of go, you know, hey, let's talk about this. Mm-hmm. And the other side is going, you can die. Mm-hmm. How, how do you yeah. yeah you can always tell I mean if you're if you're trying to communicate with someone on the left or some some radical on the left and there's people that can say my views are radical but I'm always I'm always stunned by they shut down communication they get mad and stop talking. It's like, hey, if you want to talk about why we shouldn't have abortion, why abortion is wrong, if you want to talk about you know, anything else, I'll sit and talk to you about it all day. But I try and talk to you know, you and I talk for two minutes and then you get mad and you say, hey, whoa. I was like, well, I'm not raising my voice. I'm presenting an argument and you are failing to refute it. <laughs> so you get mad and you leave. Right. So if you're, if you're the one that's saying, I'm not talking about this. Yeah, it and, seems like there's a whole group of, or a whole portion of society that has become mm-hmm. allergic to truth and fact. Yeah, and if you if, if you believe it's true, then sit here and uh, tell it to me straight. Why don't you, you know, articulate, you know, cops are all about, you have to articulate what you're doing. 
you know, you arrest somebody, you have to say why you did it. And then you get up in the front of the, the judge and the defense attorneys, he's questioning you, why'd you do this, why'd you do this? Well, I'm not gonna get mad and say, oh, I'm not talking about this anymore. No, if I believe it, I'm gonna sit there until I'm blue in the face explaining to you why I, what I did was right. And if you're not willing to do that, then maybe you're not right. If you're not willing to stand up for the, for the oath you take, then there's no point in taking that oath. Yeah.